Good morning. It remains my highest honor to be able to stand before you and to be considered a brother in Christ and then to have this grand privilege of participating in this noble endeavor to our God. Thank you for being here. Thankful for all who are visiting. We're glad to see you. Thankful for those who are watching online. We know we have quite a few who are listening faithfully every week, and we thank you for your support. But I appreciate you, brethren. Thank you for your faith this morning. In Mark chapter 4, we have this tremendous account of when Jesus calmed the storm. And we see in Mark chapter 4 that as they were going through this storm, the disciples were terrified. They thought this was it. And you would too if you've ever been on a boat or a vessel on the water and you have turbulent conditions, especially a hurricane like this could have been. You would have felt hopeless as well. You would have been terrified as well. You and I are scared of those things when we're on ground and when we're in our houses or vehicles. Imagine being on open water in something like that. But it says in Mark chapter 4 in verse 35, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat. I'm sorry, let me read that again. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, like I said, I don't think it would be any different for you or me. I mean, in those conditions, terrifying to be in something so life-threatening as that. It, it just, it's a natural response to think, okay, this is it. And their concern was, Jesus, how can you not care about this? How can you be able to dismiss this like you have? And that was all, again, very reasonable. But we see the fear, we see the emotions of those who were with Jesus... But I want to zero in on something we may not have noticed in reading this text. And that is in verse 36, it says, There were other little boats also with him. We see what happens with Jesus and the disciples he was with in the boat they were in. And you can see the commentary and then the explanation Jesus gives as to why all this is happening. And they get to hear him pronounce judgment on the wind and the sea. And they get to hear the rebuke of Jesus saying, where's your faith? But have we thought about the fact that there were other boats and there were other people in the same storm who did not get to hear the commentary of Jesus, who did not get to see the presence of Jesus with them, and that they were having to experience these storms apparently on their own without Jesus. And if you think about that, certainly that was a dramatic scene for them as well. I mean, because they could have easily thought that was the end for them, just as well as those who were with Jesus in his boat. What did they think? As they thought it was about to come to an end, and then suddenly and immediately the storm stops. Did they already think, okay, yeah, I know who did this. It's that fellow in that boat over there. He had to do this. Is that what they thought? Or were they perplexed about how this all ended the way it did so abruptly? And did they not know until they got to the shore and talking to the others that Jesus did this? 
That's why we all survived the way we did is because of Jesus. And if that's the case, how differently did they view him from this? You know, when I think about this, and I've thought about this text quite a bit, I believe you and I are in the other boat. You know, because, again, this picture could even depict it, that there was the main boat with Jesus, and then there were these little boats along the side. And like I said, they were having to go through this storm without Jesus physically being present with them. He was in the other boat. And that they had to rely on their faith to get through the storm. And that eventually they benefited from the power of Jesus and calm in the storm. And I see a great parallel there. That you and I are the little boats. We're in the little boats. The other boats that are present. Because we're having to go through the storms of life. And we don't have Jesus physically present with us to guide us through this. We have to rely on faith in Him. We have to trust in Him. That eventually he will calm the storm and eventually he will guide us through the trials of life. But for now, we have to endure. And what I see in the text of Mark chapter 4 and Matthew 8, Luke 8, on this great story, is that the way he taught them to endure that scenario is exactly how you and I are to get through the trials of life and the things that test our faith because the storms are still brewing and we know they are. And there's always going to be a storm. There's always going to be a development in our life that's going to test us and try us and make us question whether or not we should still serve the Lord. And in the midst of things like this, I think, number one, we can see Jesus still expects us to trust Him. That's what He said to these people in the aftermath of the people who were in the boat with him, he rebuked them for their lack of faith because he was able to dismiss it. It says in verse 38 that he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. Now how in the world can a man do that? Where there's water coming in the vessel, the thing is rocking all over the place and he's just asleep as if it's just another day in life. No big deal. As if he was in his hammock, just resting. How can a man do that? When the end seemed so imminent and so apparent, how could Jesus dismiss it and not let it overwhelm him? And why did he say to them in verse 40, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Why did he do that? Is it a sin for you and I to be afraid of dying? If we keep reading the story of the New Testament, especially the life of Christ, when the time came for him to come near his end, he prayed three times for that cup to pass. Jesus did not want to endure the cross. He had sweat drops of blood because of the anguish he was facing, knowing he was about to die a painful, terrifying death. It's not wrong to be afraid of death. I believe Jesus was. You don't pray for the cup to pass if you want to go through it. He was facing that trial because of his love for us and his faith in the Father. But it was unwanted. It was unwanted. And yet he still endured it with faith. Is it wrong for you and I to be afraid of death, afraid of loss in this life? I don't believe so. But what is wrong is for us to lose faith. Why were they even in the boats? You go back to chapter 3, it says in verses 9 and 10 that one of the reasons they turned to these boats is because there were so many people who wanted to see Jesus because of the miracles he was performing. In chapter 3, it says in verse 9, he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. There he is right there, a small boat. Let it be right there so I could escape. Get to it. In verse 10, For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. So the reason he had all this was because of the, the, the multitude of people who were there to touch Jesus and be around him. But see, the disciples saw all this. They saw the crowds. They saw the miracles. They saw everything Jesus was doing. And so, yeah, Jesus had a good response. 
as they're in this boat about to apparently drown, his thoughts are, why are you afraid? Why are you scared? Where's your faith? Have you not seen who I am? And can you not realize the purpose of your life here and that God is with you and that God has you on a mission and when His work for you is complete, He will take you to a better place. Can you not see that? Where's your faith? And I'm just convinced He's told us this story for us to benefit from it. We can trust God no matter how intense the storm may be. And you just don't know what type of hurricane is waiting you or what can happen in life. What's the worst storm you can face in life? What's the worst possible news you could get? Maybe today, but even on the horizon. What's the worst announcement you could have told you? A lot of bad things can happen. I think that of all things for a person to be told, whatever was told Job on the day that all ten of his children are dead, in Job chapter 1 and verse 19, he heard the worst sentence a parent could possibly hear in this world. All of your children are dead. All of them. Not one. All of them are gone. And they all died together. That has to be the worst news anybody can hear, especially as a parent. Now that's a hurricane. That's a storm. That's something where the boat is indeed filling up with water. How did Job respond? Worst news you could possibly hear. In Job chapter 1, he responded with the faith the disciples should have had when they were in the boat on the storm, or in the, the water in the storm with Jesus. In Job chapter 1, here's how Job responded in verse 20 beginning. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. The man said, I had this because of God. I came to this world with nothing. He allowed me to acquire certain things. I had these children in my life because of God. God's taken them. I came here with nothing. I leave with nothing. Thank you, God. Thank you for even letting me experience this. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting me go through this tremendous experiment called life. Thank you for letting me have the blessings you have. Now friends, that's how we're to respond. As hard as it is, as difficult as it is, that's the way God wants us to respond. And we're going to have many storms that are real... How in the world am I going to find a job to provide for my family? How, how do I find the... Am I in the right job? Can I find a better job to provide for my family? Am I ever going to overcome this weakness that just keeps coming back every so often in life? Why do I keep returning to it? Will my marriage survive? Can it even get better? How in the world do I connect with my children? How do I get along with this coworker who is so unreasonable and difficult? What's going to become of our nation? What type of future is there for our children in this nation? Now, friends, I I know that you know These are very real storms facing many people, even God's people. But how do you find peace? How do you find peace? What do you say to a person who's looking for peace in the midst of a storm? What do you possibly say? And I can promise you, you know the answer. You know it. And I know the answer. Because God has shared it with us. How do we find peace? And we understand that peace comes 
by yielding our will to God's and trusting Him. That's where it comes from. In Philippians chapter 4, we see that there are other ways you and I can respond to the trials of life. We can turn to the intoxicants. We can turn to the addictive behavior. We can turn to corrupt people. We can turn to all types of activities in life. And yet it says in Philippians chapter 4, if you want peace, it comes from asking God for it and from surrendering to Him. In Philippians chapter 4, now keep in mind, he's writing to people who are Christians. Okay, You can go back to Acts 16, that Philippian jailer who was converted to the Lord, he and his household, they obeyed the gospel. They were part of this church at Philippi. He's writing to Christians. And so I'll just tell you that, if you're not a Christian, then this doesn't apply to you just yet. You need to be in Christ. Then you have the hope that is given here to the Lord and His people. Get your sins washed away first. Get in Christ like they did. And it says in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now that's Job right there. He was in the midst of all that adversity, and yet he was still giving thanks. And then Paul says, Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there it is right there. Ask God for it. Turn it over to God. That's what he says to do. I know, easier said than done, but that's what the book says to do. And so he says pray. Give thanks. Ask for help. But pray. And God will be with you. But that's not all he says. In verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just... Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So how do we do it? We pray, we trust, and we think. We think on good things. That's how you get through it. That's how you have the faith to endure the storm. And so when I see these other little boats on the storm or in the turbulent waters... I see for us, for one thing, Jesus still expects us to trust him. How can you not think that in reading this tremendous account? Let me say another thing, though. From Mark chapter 4, the account of Jesus calming the storm, you can even see it in Luke chapter 8, is that he does calm the storm. And I think that's a second point we can learn from this great text, is that he has the ability to rebuke the wind. Now that's exactly what it says even in Luke's account of this story in Luke chapter 8. And they all say pretty much the same thing. But I read for you in Luke's account in chapter 8 verses 24 and 25. They came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. What a tremendous account. What a tremendous story. But they understood that we are in the presence of somebody who has the ability to calm the storm. He has the ability to make things Surrender to Him. And I cannot help but think that's the point He wants us to see from all of this. That He still has the ability to calm storms. Jesus still has the ability to overcome our fears. Obviously there are great storms going on around us. Even at present, I mean, good lands, the last year has been, it's been unique. The things we've experienced are unique, I would imagine, to our lifetime. First time ever for a lot of us to go through something like this. And there's all types of fallout from it. I mean, people have died from the things we've experienced. We we don't make light of that. But there have been other consequences. And the concern is, how are we going to get through this? How are we going to survive this? And it's the same answer that it's always been. 
God will see us through. Why? Because we're valuable to Him. We are of great value to God so much that He sent His Son to die for us. We are of great worth to Him because His image is within us. And He loves us. Of all the things He's made, you are at the top of His list. You're His greatest concern because you are made in His image. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tries to impress this upon us in leveraging it with the concerns of life. And we all have concerns. We all have concerns about being provided for because we understand there's no such thing as security in this life. Anything can be taken from us at any time. So how do we endure? In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tries to get us to respond to this great storm by realizing we are valuable to God and we should trust Him. In Matthew chapter 6, notice with me beginning in verse 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Now, I, I can prove it to you right now that you are very, very valuable. Well, how are you going to prove that to me? Well, you're here. You're able to get out and about. You can hear me. You can see me. What would you take for your eyesight right now? Would you take a million dollars? Would you take a million dollars to give up your eyesight? Would you take $2 million to take up your ability to hear? Would you take $3 million for your mobility? Would you take $5 million for your heart? That little organ within your body. Would you take five? What about $10 million for that heart? Would you do it? You see, you're valuable. And these things remind us that we are of great worth. The things we're able to do still yet, we're here. And we're able to think. How much would you take for your brain? Would you take $100 million for your brain right now? And we understand there is no price tag for these things. But all of these things pale in comparison to our greatest worth. You are of such great value to God that He sent His Son to die for you. Not the cows, not the moon, for you. That's how much worth you are to Him is the point Jesus is making, even in this context. You see nature, you see God providing for nature, and you're way above nature. You're of great value. And so he says, what does worry do for you? In verse 27, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now there's dispute on what that's talking about. Is it talking about your physical height or is it talking about the longevity of your life? Well, either way, it doesn't matter. Can you worry yourself taller? Can you worry yourself a longer life? Obviously not. If anything, we, we threaten our life with worry and excessive concern. But his, his point, okay, I'm going to lose sleep for the next 22 days because I'm not eight feet tall. What in the world? What, what does that do? How does worry change anything? And so he says in verse 28, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The bottom line is God is saying, look, you mean a lot to me and I'm going to see you through this. I will not let you be neglected. I will provide for you is what he's promising here. So why worry? Why feel like you're in the boat without any hope? Why feel like the storm is the end? 
Do you not realize the Son of God is overseeing your life? In Psalm 37, the Bible says in verses 25 and 26, I just, I just love these verses where it says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends and his descendants are blessed. And so Jesus calmed the storm. He'll eventually calm the storm that you and I are facing. But let me say one last thing, if I may. In regard to this great text of Jesus in the storm. And that is, God has a purpose. Jesus still has a purpose for those of us who are in the other little boats. Because they were the ones who were terrified as well. They, they had to be terrified. But the storm had a purpose. One of the reasons the storm could have occurred the way it did in Mark chapter 4 is to present us with the story we've been looking at. Is so that Jesus could use that scenario to teach everyone who would come after them the importance of trusting God. Had to be. We see that that's a benefit of scriptures in general is that we're supposed to go back and learn from everything God did with people before us. And he's told us about them. And he says in Romans 15 and verse 4, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That's one of the reasons he has given us an account to go back to, is to learn from other people. How long did that storm last the night Jesus was asleep in that ship? How long did that storm brew? Even if it was two hours, I don't know. But it was long enough for them to think, okay, this thing's over. We're, we're about, it's over. But think about it. Because of what happened to them, let's just say two hours. That two-hour event has been used by countless people to reach the conclusion, I'm going to trust God with the storms of my life. I mean, that account has been used many times over, just like we're using it this morning, to teach us the lesson of trusting God and realizing He is still in control. And I believe that's why He's told us about that event, especially in so many of His Gospels. We need to be reminded this world is His world. And He has the ability to use the events of this life to direct the affairs of mankind. Now, is that not a good lesson for us to think about even in our present circumstances? In a time when there is definitely political unrest, social unrest in our nation, divided by hate, uncertain of the future, feeling like there's no hope, how much longer will God put up with this society? Certainly you've wondered that same thing. And friends, God has shown us many times over through His Word, He is still in control. He's the one who governs here. He's the one who's able to use the storms to teach mankind. He's able to use a storm to prove He has the ability to calm the storm. In Daniel chapter 4, we need to be reminded of this from time to time, that God has power over governments, and He has the ability to install certain people within the government, to accomplish His will. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that everything they do is met with His approval. It just simply means He's able to use men, both good and evil, to accomplish His will. And He's always been that way. In Daniel chapter 4, it says this, and, and it's repeated in the chapter by Daniel, by this dream, and then by Nebuchadnezzar himself. They were just impressing us with the fact God controls this world. In Daniel chapter 4, it says in verse 17, This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever He will, and sets over it the lowest of men. And so that, that's again showing God has power to use this world to accomplish his purpose. In verse 36, Nebuchadnezzar said, At the same time my reason returned, 
to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. And that's just the bottom line, is that God has the power to use this world to do what he wants. And he can use governments to do that, is the proof Nebuchadnezzar presents us with. So what do we do about it? How in the world do we get through the storm that's brewing with all that could happen in our nation in the days ahead or the years ahead? How do we respond to it? Well, I think of what it says in Habakkuk because this is a great text again to show who has the ultimate control. Because at this time, if you can find the book of Habakkuk, I know it's, it's not one we go to a lot, but if you look up the book of Habakkuk, what is happening is that the kingdom of Judah is eventually going to go into Babylonian captivity. And Habakkuk is seeing this. And he says in chapter 1, in verses 2 through 4, Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity? And cause me to see trouble. For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Well does that sound familiar? I mean can we even envision what he was witnessing? Of injustice in this world. And evil apparently winning. God says okay. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. And he talks about this great nation that's going to come and judge the nation of God. And Habakkuk, of course, says, what? How can you use... A nation that's worse than us morally to judge us. How could that possibly be the right answer? But even as he utters that concern, he responds by saying, I'll trust you. Chapter 2 and verse 1, I will stand my watch, set my ramp, myself on the rampart, and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. He says, okay, I'm gonna, this doesn't make sense to me, but I'm going to let God have the final say. Can we not have the same concern for our nation? I mean, I know we're not the nation of God, but can we not have the same concern over the same things that seem to be happening around us? Do we not have the same issues at hand? Are we concerned about the future of this nation? Well, I tell you, you should be. You should be concerned. Because from what I can see, there are things that are happening in our society that were happening in other societies that God judged for those wicked things. Do you realize that Virginia's Department of Education recently adopted a policy that requires schools to use the students' preferred pronouns to allow students to use the bathroom of their choice without question. This was just enacted this year. The document states that faculty and students are to use the students' preferred pronouns or face disciplinary action that is considered a form of harassment. This is what the school systems in Virginia have to deal with. School staff are not allowed to question students entering the bathroom or locker rooms that do not comport with their outward appearance or gender. This is happening in the United States of America. How in the world did we get in this predicament? How did we get to this point where you can't even question the obvious about a person's gender and sexuality? Well, I can't pinpoint how we got here, but I can pinpoint what we need to do. Friends, you're needed. Light is needed. Salt is needed to save this nation 
Godly people are needed to preserve this nation. I think of what God said to Abraham. Where God was about to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham says, well, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? What if there are just ten righteous people? Will you spare the city? God says, you find me ten and I won't do it. I'll spare them. Couldn't even find ten. Righteousness exalts a nation. You are needed. Your morality is needed. Your faith is needed. Your presence is needed to spare this nation and spare this world. And when it seems like all hope is over, the best commentary you can read on any political concern are the last four verses of the book of Habakkuk. Because here this man was told, okay, I'm going to bring in this nation and they're terrible and they're going to judge my nation. And Habakkuk could hear all this and see all this before it happened and he trembled at the thought of this. And yet his response was, hey, God's in control and I trust him. He knows what he's doing. In Habakkuk chapter 3, notice this in verse 16 beginning. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. Now listen to this. This is as real as it gets. He says in verse 17, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high heels. Listen, he's saying, listen, if it's just totally annihilated, I trust God. I trust God to lead me through. And if he could do that, with what he was up against in his society, then you and I can do the same. We can still trust that God has a purpose for all of this and that he will have the final say eventually because every knee must bow to him. Well, you've listened patiently once more, and I thank you, friends. I thank you for your kind consideration, and I hope some things were said to help us in the trials we're up against because we all have them from time to time, and there's just no sense in pretending like they're not coming. They are here, and we know that. But let me ask you, what is God's greatest concern for you? Is it to extend life for this nation? Is it to bless you materially in this world? Is that God's greatest concern, to give you long life? I think we know the answer. God's greatest concern is what he tells us to do. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. That's his greatest concern, which is why it should be ours as well. And what is God most concerned with in light of that? It's about you and I being focused on eternal things, spiritual things, where He is. Why? Because this world's going to pass. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen... But the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's what we use to appeal to you this morning in coming to the Lord. You look at what you can't see. The things you do see are temporary, but the things you can't see are eternal. And that especially is true with your soul. And so we encourage you that if you're not a Christian, do like the Philippians did. They heard the truth about Jesus, turned away from every sin they knew of, made that great confession, and were immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, as we can all do today, Acts 22 and 16. It could be you've done some things that need to be corrected publicly. We'll pray with you. Or it could be that you need the encouragement of the saints here. We'll pray with you and encourage you as well. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, come to Him as we stand and sing.